Mutual funds are one of the most popular investment vehicles out there, with 31% of Canadian households currently having their wealth invested in them. But some investors aren't looking for the all-in-one package provided by mutual fund. Instead, they turn to cheaper alternatives that trade off convenience for lower fees. So what are these low-cost alternatives, and how do they differ from mutual funds? We'll answer these questions and more on today's Plain Bagel. In the last video, we covered some managed solutions, such as mutual funds, that allow people to access the expertise of investment professionals. Professionals help everyday investors select suitable investments, manage their holdings, and provide counsel on various topics, such as home buying and tax management. These services, however, do come at a cost. After all, there are a number of expenses that need to be covered to run the fund. First, you've got to cover the salary of the portfolio manager, and there will be a team of investment analysts that help with the research, so we need to compensate them as well. There's the price involved with actually buying and selling the holdings of the account, and there may be a commission to pay to the representative who sold you the fund. Oh, and there's the work involved with purchasing and redeeming mutual funds, the cost of the bookkeeping, rebalancing, administration fees, load fees, these costs can add up to sizable expenses for the investor. And some may find the fees are justified. If you are provided a helpful advisor that provides you regular counsel, and you value the convenience of the solution, then there's no issue. However, some investors are not interested in the advice and simply want the investment product at the lowest possible cost. As such, a number of low-cost alternatives have entered the ring in the last few decades, of which you've probably heard the most about the Exchange Traded Fund. The ETF is similar to a mutual fund. Both involve pooling money from a number of investors and treating the money as one portfolio. But there are several key differences. And to fully understand these differences, we must first understand a key component of the fund. Exchanges. An exchange is simply a location where investors trade their holdings with other investors. Hence the name. Examples of exchanges include the New York Stock Exchange, and in Canada we have the Toronto Stock Exchange. You've probably seen scenes of these exchanges before, like this one though computers have largely replaced the yelling that's stereotypical of these settings. Exchanges can be accessed from anywhere in the world via the internet, so you don't need to be physically present to use one. Now from the name you can probably tell that exchange traded funds are traded via these exchanges, which runs counter to how mutual funds are purchased. For example, if you wanted to buy a mutual fund unit from Bagel Financial, you would need to go to a Bagel Financial location and buy a unit from one of their representatives. Likewise, to sell your unit, you'd go back to the same institution and redeem it to get your money back, plus whatever return you've earned. But you wouldn't be able to buy a Bagel Financial ETF directly from the company. This is because when an ETF is created, the company sells the unit directly to an authorized participant, typically a very large financial institution who then sells them into an exchange. The company itself will then no longer administer the purchase of these units, meaning that to get a unit after it's been issued, you have to find someone else in an exchange who already has one. Likewise, ETFs can't be redeemed directly, but instead need to be sold to a buyer via an exchange. So that sounds like a pretty big inconvenience. Why would a fund do this? Well, the main reason is that it saves the company a number of costs. Because investors trade the units amongst themselves, there's no fund representative that needs to sell the units, whereas mutual funds typically hire and compensate a sales team of sorts to promote and sell their units. Secondly, because ETFs aren't redeemed with the issuer, financial institutions save money on their fund administration, as they no longer need to create and redeem units as frequently as demand dictates. Some ETFs are also able to save costs by following index tracking strategies, which means that instead of hiring a team of analysts to research which companies to buy and sell, they simply mimic an index. What is an index, you may ask? Well, to oversimplify, an index is a list of companies that are deemed representative of a certain country or sector. The S&P 500, for example, is a list of the 500 largest US companies by market capitalization, and is often used as an indicator of the US markets. So when an ETF tracks one of these indices, they are investing in what that index holds. This means that you can buy an ETF that mimics US stocks by buying an S&P 500 ETF, or you can invest in UK healthcare stocks, or global newspaper firms, or Canadian dog boot stores, probably. Aside from making a straightforward product, mimicking an index allows ETFs to again save on its operating costs. There are plenty of mutual funds that also offer index tracking strategies, but because ETFs have other cost-cutting methods in place, ETFs can typically offer the same strategies for cheaper, which is what led to their wide adoption. ETFs now offer non-tracking strategies as well, which means you may run into ETFs with higher fees than mutual funds, but generally speaking, they cost less to own. 
Now, there are certainly some cons to using ETFs. The first of which has to do with their pricing. Because ETFs are traded on an exchange, their price is entirely determined by the individual prices set by investors buying and selling the units on the exchange. Mutual funds, on the other hand, have their price calculated using a simple sum of the parts approach. For example, if a fund holds 10 $100 shares and there are 50 fund units held by investors, then each unit would respectively have a net asset value of $20. Mutual fund companies will calculate this amount at the end of each trading day and sell their units at this price. ETFs, on the other hand, may not trade at this level, even if they have the exact same holdings and net asset value, since there's no central source setting the price. ETF prices usually follow very closely to their NAV, but it is worth noting this added price volatility. Additionally, unless you go through an independent advisor, buying an ETF will typically be a self-directed process whereas mutual fund representatives typically narrow down their list of offerings based on your risk tolerance, there's no point of contact for ETFs, which may leave you asking, should you buy multiple ETFs or just one? What about the healthcare ETF? Or should you get the dog boot ETF? I don't know, probably. So there is a trade-off with ETFs in that you'll have to take on a bit of the work yourself when selecting which ones to use. Unless, of course, you use technology to save you the work. You see, the industry has created another low-cost tool to help investors that don't want to deal with people but still want the advice, the robo-advisor. A robo-advisor, despite its name, is not really a robot or an advisor for that matter. As it currently stands, it is simply a software that asks investors certain questions and then uses algorithms to select investments for that person based on their responses. Robo-advisors often buy and sell ETFs for their clients and will charge an additional fee on top of ETF fees. Though these fees are often small given that the algorithms are able to replace some of the company's labor. Robo-advisors aren't yet widely adopted in the field. They currently only manage over $70 billion, while there's about $32 trillion under management in the US. However, many believe that they will increase in popularity as demographics of the general population change to more tech-savvy consumers. In their current form, robo-advisors provide pretty bare-bones rebalancing and allocation services, but who knows? With advancements in artificial intelligence, it may very well play a bigger role in the near future. So, there are plenty of ways to invest. Doing it by yourself can save you money, but you'll need to educate yourself and take the time to properly manage your holdings. Using a managed solution, on the other hand, makes investing easy and can offer you a point of contact to address any concerns or questions you have, though these services come at a cost. Now that we know the basics of the basics, we need to start getting into the details. For examples, what kind of investment strategies exist out there, and what are the fees you have to pay when investing? We'll talk about these topics in future videos, but for now we're out of time. If you like this video, please hit the like button, and if you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. If you have any feedback or topics you'd like us to cover in future videos, please leave a comment down below. For The Plain Bagel, my name is Richard Coffin, thanks for joining me today.